great to see you here today for today's lecture. My name is George Lankford. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and it's really a pleasure to introduce the fifth annual Wally Lecture in Sciences and Humanities. Uh, this lecture is named in honor of Professor Wally. He's a distinguished member of our faculty in the Department of Physics. Kamesh is well known among us. He's now emeritus, but he's been a part of our family since 1969. We are very fond of him and his family. His research has made him an internationally renowned physicist with expertise in fundamental particles and their interactions. In addition, Professor Wally's work includes a book on the physics of music and a definitive biography of Chandra, the Nobel Prize laureate in physics. And this impressive biography is enriched by the friendship that exists between Wally and Chandra. I want to especially thank his three daughters who established this lecture series as an expression of their admiration and gratitude to their father for his vision, for his leadership, and dedication to SU and the community. So please join me in thanking them for this generous gift to the party. So today's lecture is given by uh, Professor Zayank. Did I pronounce your name? Zayank. Um, I knew I would mess it up. But we're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm especially pleased to hear of your relationship with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I know that that will inform your remarks today. As many of you know, we had His Holiness here on our campus this past fall, and we benefited greatly from his wisdom and his teachings. I also want to thank those who made this lecture possible. The physics department have been the host of this lecture, and the Syracuse University Humanities Center has been a annual sponsor. And I want to thank Professor Eric Schiff, who helped to organize the event. And I now turn the podium over to him to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, today's uh, lecturer, Arthur Zients, has had a fascinatingly varied and distinguished career. It began in a seemingly conventional way with baccalaureate and doctoral degrees in physics from the University of Michigan, with a research fellowship in Colorado and a professorship at Amherst College, and a number of interesting and well-received research papers on topics such as electron excitation of lithium S and D states, which you probably haven't thought about for some time now, <laughs> and delayed choice experiments in quantum interference. Uh, for the non-physicist I, present, I wish to assure you that neither of these will be extensively discussed today. In parallel with this um, somewhat conventional aspect of his career as an academic physicist, our speaker had been publishing papers all along on what he has called occasionally Goethe's way of science. Uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, who died in 1832, is mostly known today for his literary works, such as the magnificent play Faust. Goethe's science is less well known, and indeed Goethe's science is rather alien to the interests of the preponderance of today's scientists, because in his researchers, researches, Goethe gave parody to understanding external phenomena such as light and to understanding how the mind perceives these phenomena. Of the dozens of elementary physics textbooks I've seen in my own career as a physics professor, I don't recall any that approach this parody. But in his career, our speaker has taken the Goethean path, giving parody to the way of modern science and to studies of the mind. His successes with both aspects make him particularly able to explain science and its values to those whose concerns are mainly humanist ones and to explain to those with a scientific worldview the importance of understanding the mind. An early milestone was his 1993 book, Catching the Light, The Entwined History of Light and Mind, and he's now published another half dozen further volumes addressing varied audiences, physics students and physicists, 
Goethe scholars, people interested in contemplative practice, educators at all levels. At Amherst College, Professor Zients established the Center for Con Contemplative Mind and Society, and he recently accepted the presidency of the Mind and Life Institute in Hadley, Massachusetts. He has many other distinctions, ranging from holding a Fulbright professorship at the University of Innsbruck to being the General Secretary of the Anthroposophical Society in America. And over the years, our speaker has established a close friendship and collaboration with the Dalai Lama, which has led to two books, one of which is the record of five days of dialogue between a group of distinguished scientists and the Dalai Lama. And of course, most of you will recall last fall's visit of the Dalai Lama to Syracuse for the One World Concert. So today's talk is on the related theme, as you can see, Conversing with the Dalai Lama, 25 Years of Dialogue Between Science and Contemplative Philosophy. Please join me in welcoming Arthur Zients, this year's Kameshwar C. Lecturer, Kameshwar C. Wally Lecturer, on the Sciences and Humanities to Syracuse. I'd like to begin by thanking the Wally family uh, for the invitation to be here today and to also to Eric for being such a wonderful host. You know, the, uh, the theme we're taking up, you could say the theme not just of 25 years of dialogue with the Dalai Lama, but the, the broader theme which this, which this whole lecture series represents is the intersection and the collaboration of the humanities and the sciences. This has been something which has occupied me through my entire professional life, I could say from the time I was 20 or so. How does one live a life which is, in some sense, a, in some sense which is whole? Not only specializing in one particular esoteric dimension of the sciences, but actually to embrace the whole of life and to find ways of engaging it and contributing to it in just that manner. And uh, of course, I was counseled in a variety of ways against this outrageous idea, but I think, in fact, I'm convinced that the world needs that kind of dialogue, collaboration across disciplines and even across cultures. So what I'm going to be speaking about this afternoon is really that kind of exchange across two cultures. Uh, a culture which is a contemplative religion, Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, and I'll start out by saying I'm actually not Buddhist. Um, some of my best friends are Buddhists. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, be that as it may, uh, I do feel that the, the contemplative philosophical traditions have much to relate to us in the sciences in as much as we're both engaged with experience, let's say. They're both empirical in character. And I actually think the, uh, the, the problems we confront in our society will be best addressed when we have these two together. So let me begin with this uh, wonderful theme, the theme of 25 years of science dialogues with the, with the Dalai Lama. Uh, by telling a story. It's actually a story which his holiness tells about himself in childhood. So here he is around, I don't know, 10 years old, let's say. He was born in uh, 1935, so this is around 1945. And he had a habit of uh, looking through the telescope, the telescope of the 13th Dalai Lama, and uh, peering around mostly, I think, looking to see what the real people were doing down there outside the big palace in Lhasa. But he also occasionally would look at the moon. And he recounts how he, uh, at one point, desired to see the rabbit in the moon. We have the man in the moon, but evidently they have a rabbit in the moon. So he trained his telescope on the moon, and he noticed something. He noticed that there were shadows, what he took to be shadows, that were being cast by what he then took to be mountains on this surface of the moon. And if there were shadows cast by mountains, then there must be a source of light that cast the shadows, which he then noticed could be related to the place that the sun was occupying in the heavens. And so he inferred from his own observations something which was actually not taught as part of his education. You have to understand that he had absolutely no scientific education. The education he had was in the great classical traditions of Buddhist monastic universities, but nothing, by the way, of 
science as we would know it. So the Dalai Lama performed his own, you might say, first scientific observation at around 10 years of age. And he longed throughout that period to really find ways of engaging, you could say, the natural world scientifically, something which, was, which would have to wait for some decades to be fulfilled. I can't help but think back in our own Western civilization to a similar set of observations being made in the year 1609 with the telescope which Galileo had made himself. And he, in that year, over the course of three weeks, made his own sketches, drawings, of what it is he saw, a couple of which you see up here on the left. He made exactly the same kind of inference. Now, the moon, the sun, and especially any of the planets that were beyond were thought to be part, in the classical world, of a domain of the fifth essence, the quintessence, the eternal and immutable and perfect crystalline spheres. And so the idea that there were mountains on Mars, excuse me, mountains on the moon, shadows being cast by the sun, which itself had its own sunspots, these were all being noted and were the source of a controversy which led, as you all know, ultimately in 1633 to being tried before the Catholic Church for heresy. You know that he was uh, threatened with torture. He was actually nearly put to death. Uh, he had certain friends that basically ma managed to convert those sentences to be uh, under house arrest, which he, which he was until his death in nine years later in 1642. The church had maintained that the earth itself was stationary, right? And that the sun was going around the earth, whereas Galileo held the opposite. And basically did the same kind of reasoning that the Dalai Lama did many centuries, three centuries later. Now, it helps if you're the Pope of the Buddhist tradition, right? So you don't get tried in a situation like this. Um, but I'd like to uh, switch over now from that little story of the, I think, exemplifies what was a kind of unique interest within Tibet, which His Holiness had. You have to remember there was no one there to teach him any of the sciences. He would dig around in the, in the storeroom and find the Meccano set or an old car that had been donated by the, by the English, you know, but there were no real roads to run it on. So, I mean, there, were, there was just really no opportunity to fulfill that curiosity which he had until, frankly, he was, he was put in exile uh, some, some years later. Then started a series of conversations, conversations with scientists like von Weizsäcker and David Bohm, uh, and also then 25 years ago with a scientist by the name of Francisco Varela, who was a neuroscientist in Paris at that point, and a friend of his, an acquaintance of his by the name of Adam Engel, who was a businessman, and they arrived 25 years ago, or a little bit more, with the, both of them with the same idea, the idea that it would be perhaps useful and interesting to simply satisfy the personal interests of this man that they both admired, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, by bringing five or six scientists to his living room, he wasn't so famous then, to his living room, and uh, have an intensive five-day, six-day conversation with him. Each scientist being given an entire day to work their theme with him, every morning being basically delivering content and answering technical questions, and then the afternoon being given more to general conversation around the, th the themes and the questions that that, it, that that theme evoked. The goal became, over the years, more generalized, so that now those dialogues are really meant to serve a larger purpose than the personal interest of His Holiness or the personal interest of those of us who are there. So now we say that the Mind and Life Institute seeks to join contemplative insights and practices, very often present through His Holiness's uh, person, but also with other Buddhist scholars that are there, with modern scientific research capabilities, and then use that resulting knowledge to catalyze and develop programs for alleviating suffering and supporting human flourishing all around the world. This is now, you could say, the 
the goal of mind and life. It started with a personal interest and has become something quite different. Let me just go back to those first 15 years when we were meeting with him in his living room. Here's an example, an example from a dialogue which was actually on the nature of matter and the nature of life. You may recognize that uh, there's a person here, well that's me obviously, but Stephen Chu, who I understand was here not too long ago, this is before he became Secretary of Energy, this is back around 2001 I think. Myself, this is Eric Lander, who was head of the Human Genome Project at MIT. Uh, Tunjin Jimpa, the primary translator for His Holiness. The Karmapa, who, was a young, who as a young man fled basically in the same kind of way that His Holiness fled in order to find his own teachers. Mathieu Ricard. Mathieu Ricard received his PhD in molecular biology in the Pasteur Institute and then did what he calls a 40 year postdoc in meditation and studying of Buddhist uh, philosophical traditions. Michelle Bitbull from Paris has a PhD in physics, an MD, and a PhD in philosophy. He's a scholar of Schrodinger's writings and uh, philosophy of science. So this is the kind of community that comes and shows up every couple of years and takes up a topic of common interest and concern. The next one will be in October of this year. We are going to be taking up the theme of craving, desire, and addiction uh, from, again, a multidisciplinary standpoint. Craving is one of the three poisons, I'm, I'm told, in Buddhist philosophy. And obviously, there is a universal problem with addictions that are born out of those desires which become uncontrolled obsessions. So we'll be gathering around this kind of this table, this coffee table. Again, each day, there'll be a topic. One or two people will speak to that topic. And then the whole thing will be brought into a lively and sometimes absolutely engaging and penetrating uh, kind of analysis and, uh, and discussion. So for 25 years, that's gone on. Let me just give you uh, my very first session with him was actually doing some experiments that Goethe would have done, namely picking up a prism and looking through it. He had never looked through a prism before. And when he held it up to his eyes, he actually asked a very interesting question. Where are the colors? You hold up a prism and you look at an edge or a light source of some sort, you'll see colors around the source of light or the edge of a light and dark area that separate a light and dark area. But then he looked at the prism and wondered whether the colors were in there. He looked at the light source and he saw no colors with his naked eye. So he began to ponder, where are the colors? What's the relationship that allows these colors to arise? It's a little bit like saying, where is the rainbow? Right? If you think about it, it's a tough question, actually. Where is the rainbow? I was actually using this as a way of going from what were sense phenomena to those aspects of physics which were not sense phenomena. Here's a scanning tunneling microscope image of a solid surface. And we talked then at the hand of these different kinds of phenomena about the role of authority, the role of valid inference, as they call it, or logic, and the role of direct experience. These are the three valid forms of cognition in Buddhist philosophy. And they also play a role, obviously, in the sciences. The authority of the professor or the person who's publishing the valid inference that's being made where you're inferring the existence of something you may not be able to see. Think of quarks, right? completely confined, but yet we're able to infer their existence. And then the possibility of direct perception. I actually asked him, is it always possible to convert something which you've inferred into something which you see? You know, If you infer the existence of fire from smoke on the hill, you can always go over there and take a look and see that the fire is there. Is that always possible? At which point he laughed and said, yes, it's always possible within Buddhist philosophy, but it may take many lifetimes before you're able to get to that point. So it depends on your metaphysics, I guess. At that same meeting in 1997 on the new physics and cosmology, Anton Zeilinger, who's a wonderful quantum experimental physicist who looks at the foundations of quantum mechanics, was also there. And he managed to bring in 
do something which nowadays I think would be totally impossible because he had these very high-tech electronic apparatus that anyone would have thought were definitely something to do with high explosives and triggering mechanisms. But anyway, he had a miniature wave-particle duality experiment which he was able to look at single photons. And so we had this uh, very elegant demonstration of waves, particles, as both aspects of the nature of light. And one of the things which is particularly puzzling is the so-called randomness with which these photons arrive at the photodetector. And if you have uranium or something and it decays, the, the rate of decay, the half-life, is very well known, but the specifics of those mechanisms of why a particular nucleus in uranium will fragment versus some other nucleus, that's not understood. And in fact, we believe that it may never be understood, that it is just simply one of the facts of quantum mechanics. The same sort of thing with the de-excitation of an atom giving off a photon, that this is a random process. Now, randomness as a concept is well known to Buddhist philosophy, but it's always thought of as a subjective ignorance that we just happen to meet today seems perhaps partially random but there actually is a reason, namely you came to hear a lecture, you came up to talk to me, and maybe we even had, from the standpoint of Buddhism, they allow for very subtle causes, like that random event may be partly karmic. All right? They call those subtle causes. So there are coarse-level causes and there are subtle causes, but there's always a cause. And yet here in quantum mechanics, there seems to be an objective randomness to the actual events that unfold in the case of radioactivity, for example, or photon detection and de-excitation of the atoms. So there are things that are without cause, we would say. They're without cause in quantum mechanics. And from the standpoint of Buddhism, this violates their, their deep commitment to causality. So this would be an, another example, another example of the ways in which the dialogue comes to uh, explore themes that are of common interest and oftentimes they are also themes which we come to loggerheads over. One of the uh, other characteristics is the fellowship, you could say. The fellowship associated with sitting around for five days and during those five days really having a wonderful and intensive conversation such that by the end there's a fellowship and friendship that often endures beyond the occasion we can come together to, to, to work we do. Now out of each of these dialogues has come books. There are 11 books that have been uh, written. Uh, you can see the one with the uh, colorful circles. That's the physics and cosmology book. But around uh, 2001, 2002, we began to have conversations together and with His Holiness to say that, you know, we've been at this for nearly 15 years isn't it about time that beyond the books themselves that there was some way of sharing out the conversations which were becoming increasingly rich, a lot of fun, deeply insightful, and felt to be of some value. And so His Holiness urged us to take steps to, to as we deepen the work that we were doing, and there were two sides that we decided to, uh, two ways of doing that that we decided to, to make use of. The first was to fund some research on certain of the contemplative practices that were being discussed as part of some of these mind and life dialogues. I've featured the physics ones, but most of the mind and life dialogues have been concerned with the nature of consciousness, neuroscience, sleeping, dreaming, destructive emotions, a whole variety of, you could say, psychological and philosophy of mind kinds of themes. And so we funded the work in part of Richard Davidson, who then collaborated with Mathieu Ricard. Here you see a uh, now quite typical sort of shot that's been broadcast in the press. In the early days, it was more unusual, but Richard Davidson, who's got his back to you, and Mathieu are, in this case and in the case of the functional MRI, basically looking at the power of concentration and compassion through exercises and contemplative practice that were being examined really 
systematically at the highest resolution with the most sophisticated uh, apparatus for really the first time. So eight expert meditators, by expert meditators one means individuals with over 10,000 hours of practice, that's the definition of an expert. I've come to understand 10,000 hours of practice with a tennis racket qualifies you. Most of these gentlemen, and I think they were all men in this case, uh, had much more, 20, 30,000 hours of practice. What were the results of these? Now, I'm no neuroscientist, so I can only repeat some of the things that were being described in these papers. You can see that there's a resting state, and then there's a meditative state, and then there's a band, so-called gamma band, uh, which has uh, a very high amplitude. In fact, according to uh, Richie, these three graphs show that the highest gamma activity in phase synchrony, phase synchrony means that those vibrations, those oscillations that you're seeing uh, in the, over here on the right hand side, are synchronous across large regions of the brain, that these are the highest level of gamma and synchrony ever reported, and that also that there's a baseline difference. That is to say, when you return to the resting state, you don't return to the same state that a naive meditator would return to, but there is an adjustment up so that there's a difference between these two groups. So that there are long-term traits, as well as extraordinary ability to modulate the activity within these particular neural pathways. Those two features, that you take the equipment you have and you're able to use it in ways that are exceptional, you're able to modulate, and this is something like four or five standard deviations, as I understand it, away from the normal distribution that one has in the range of, uh, of, of gamma ray activity, gamma activity. Um, so you modulate with greater intensity the, the, the gamma band, and there are also long-term traits. Those long-term traits really point to um, structural changes, which were then later on measured to be the case by people like Sarah Lazar at Mass General and Harvard University. So Richie ends his uh, paper by saying these data suggest that mental training involves temporal integrative mechanisms that gives you the phase synchrony and may induce not only short-term, but also long-term neural changes. Now that result was reported at the MIT meeting which we organized, which was our first public meeting in 2003. I was the moderator for that meeting together with Ann Harrington from Harvard University. And I must say it was an extraordinary gathering. Over a thousand people in the Kresge Auditorium introduced by the president of the university. And it really represented in some sense the first time that these two great traditions of science and contemplative spirituality stood on the same stage and with great respect engaged the same problem, namely the question of attention, emotion, and mental imagery. It was called Investigating the Mind and it, and it worked over two days. Each session was one where we had you know, everyone from David Kahneman, Nobel Prize winning psychologist and economist, on one side with a whole raft of people of comparable stature and a similar group on the other side from the Buddhist traditions, uh, contemplatives and scholars, and they address themselves to the qu qualities and characteristics of attention, its cultivation, its sustaining, and so on, in ways that were brilliant and deeply penetrating. One could feel that the thousand people in the room were there in some sense, not only to learn from these two different traditions, but almost as a kind of festival moment where the two traditions which had been so long apart came together and really came together on behalf of, again, this wholeness which represents the fullness of human endeavor and human seeking. President Vest, I think, really wrapped it up and said something really beautiful when he said, you know, we have for too long stayed apart. Now there's nothing to fear, really, by bringing these two great traditions together in order to understand the nature of consciousness and the nature of the mind. Uh, here's another photograph of Stephen Coslin producing uh, visual illusions and working with His Holiness on those. Frankly, many of those failed. There was cultural differences were so great.
that they didn't work out so well, which was a, quite a funny moment in the whole, whole, whole event. And out of these came reports, reports of the scientific literature, in the scientific literature, for example, Ritchie presented his data for the first time there and then was published later on in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. If you look at 2003, on this graph, this is right around here, you can see that there's a beginning of an uptick in the number of papers. This is a growth in the mindfulness research literature across 30 years. There's a growth in the number of papers from very, very few up to something like 350 in the year 2010. So this is a really a huge increase. Similarly, if one looks at the funding that the NIH provides from all of its institutions, not just for alternative uh, health care and such like, but it's now over $150 million a year to about 150 different uh, grantees. So the number of publications, the amount of funding, the seriousness with which one is engaging this whole meditation and mindfulness domain is really changed in the years, 25 years that we, we've been active. One of the things that happened after this conference was that there was a real outpouring of interest in mind and life, especially on by younger people, younger scientists, younger scholars who were looking to somehow integrate these dimensions of their own life, their interest in contemplation, their interest in the values that are associated with that, and their own scientific or scholarly work. The hundreds of letters and emails and such like that we got led to the summer school which we have. It's a called the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, the SRI, which brings about 150 of these young people together over the last 10 years each summer. We have an integrated program of science and contemplative instruction and practice, where every day we start with practice, we end with practice, the third day is a, silent, a day of silent practice, and in between times is a distinguished faculty of some of the finest minds in any particular area that we're working with. This year it's going to be mapping the mind. How does one understand the various functional dimensions of and, and components that go into making up the mind from the standpoint of Western psychology, philosophy of mind, from the standpoint also of the Abhidharma with its 52 mental factors that comprise the mind. In other words, a really cross-cultural and interdisciplinary study of the nature of consciousness in the mind itself. That's an example uh, of the upcoming Together with that were Young Investigator Awards uh, that we started to give, the so-called Varela Awards, named after Francisco Varela, who died now 10 years ago. Um, these have stimulated an extraordinary amount of research. So there are about 100 of these fellows now that have been given grants, uh, some of which have led to follow-on grants. Uh, the the all-time high is $5 million in follow-on grants from Philip Golden, who's now at Stanford. The idea being that by giving small $10,000 awards early in the career of some people like, like these really talented young people, it'll help them develop a career of con contributing to what has become an emerging area, for example, of contemplative neuroscience. There's a little uh, image down on the lower right. So here's the US version of the Garrison Institute, 150 young people. This is us in South Indian Monastery where I was in January. I'll be talking about this a little bit later, but there were several thousand monks who were part of a South India event that we just returned from in January. So the Summer Research Institute and the Varela Awards have done much to support and develop this whole field of inquiry, a field of inquiry that has now become an active, very active way of researching through what Francisco Varela always called the neurophenomenology. Neurophenomenology is the science of contemplation. That is to say, you take the neuroscience and measurements that someone like Ritchie can make in his functional MRI machines and through the skull, skull cap electrode set, and you study using the best techniques of Western science what it is that's happening in the brain and the nervous system during meditation or other kinds of practices. But from the other side, and this is equally important, and I think really something that's, that's difficult for us to adjust to, it's not only that one does the biology, if you will, and the neurophysiology of meditation, but one takes meditation itself as an investigative tool. 
as a way of performing a kind of contemplative research or inquiry into the nature of the mind itself by turning the, 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 the lens of attention of the mind onto the mind itself one can explore inwardly what it is that's taking place through that careful analysis and then one brings these two together so you have a neurophenomenology in the sense that a neuroscience is joined to a phenomenology of consciousness so that was the second major phase so the first was really the phase of 25 years of, you could say, dialogue, which continues all the way to the present day. Layered on top of that then comes research and a kind of uh, public education through the uh, working with graduate students and postdocs and young, uh, young scholars and scientists who are interested in, in, in integrating contemplative practice with their scientific methods and technologies. So here we are. In, 2012, 2013, and the next phase is clearly a phase which needs new attention. This is when I became president of Mind and Life, and we're in the midst of that transition. There's a transition, you could say, really from growing a community from a relative handful of people around the, 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 the coffee table in the living room of His Holiness, talking shop, so to speak, to say, well, this is, this is actually of interest not only to us but through the books of interest to others going to MIT creating a larger community a community of scholars younger and older who are interested academically in research in bringing insight and understanding to this domain both of the nat nature of the mind and the nature of reality as we might explore it through physics but now you have this quite large community, some 20,000 people are, you might say, in our network. They range from people in the North American continent, but also many in Europe, also Asia. So we begin to have a global community. Is there value in applying what it is we know to what we would call human flourishing? Is there a way that what we know can be of service to give to the human being a more flourishing and a healthy life. Now, what I'm going to be describing now is just in its inception. We're calling it a variety of things. His Holiness calls it the need for what he calls a secular ethics. He probably spoke about that here, is my guess. Yes, an ethics which is not tied to any particular religion, but is basically a characteristic of our humanity. Is there some way we can become Somebody's more fully human by practicing an ethic of compassion towards all other sentient beings. And how does one develop that possibility already in early childhood so that by the time we become adults, this has become part of our habitus. This is the way we are in the world. Compassionate, ethical human beings helping each other to attain the full flourishing of which we are capable. Again, this mapping of the mind will help us understand the foundations for those afflictive, what are sometimes called afflictive emotions or non-virtuous emotions or distractions and cravings that basically take us astray. And so we need to alleviate those as we understand also the means by which we can promote the compassion and flourishing. So we are exercising through particular kinds of methods and means, which I'll describe in a minute. Compassion, we're cultivating those capacities on the understanding of the nature of the mind and working against those which deflect us and cause suffering. And we do that in this integrated modality. That is to say, we not only have the scientific down here perspective, right? We also have a contemplative perspective. And in addition, more recently, we've begun to work with the humanities to take into account the social and cultural perspective as well. So this provides for us what we call an integrated research model, where you bring all of these dimensions together as a way of catalyzing research and its applications through an emerging global community with not only mind and life, but also many individual and institutional partners. The human flourishing at the center, you could say, looked at through these various lenses globally and in collaboration with many others. Now, how do we go about doing that? You know, how we go about doing that is by engaging our global community in a variety of ways. 
First of all, we've just begun a Mind and Life Institute in Europe, centered in Zurich. It'll have its first event in October. It'll be an event with about 600 uh, fe fellow Mind and Life uh, enthusiasts and interested parties, researchers primarily, who'll be giving papers in Berlin. We've also been to Asia. We'll be starting a Mind and Life uh, Asia by beginning with the Japan Japanese, again, starting uh, in the spring of 2014. The International Symposium, which we had in Denver, will be repeated in Boston in October of 2014, bringing people from all over the world. Something well over 2,000 people are expected. His Holiness will be delivering one of the talks but many, many papers as well. We have web-based communications that are being set up to connect us with our friends all around the world. And then I'll mention, finally, the Mind and Life, the new Visiting Scholars Program, which is taking place at Amherst College on its campus. Just to give you a picture, this is the new Mind and Life House for Visiting Scholars and for research workshops, which we'll be hosting there as well. We just took possession, was renovated by the college for our use, and so we're making use of this house as our visiting scholars uh, place. And if there are any visiting scholars here, anybody would like to make use of that facility, contact me and we'll put you in one of the offices. This is not Amherst College. <laughs> But I couldn't resist because this is the debating courtyard of the monastery associated with His Holiness's residence. So you've got our own debating courtyard here, you could say, at the Mind and Life Institute and uh, comparable young monks in their daily practice of education. Now, this slide is meant also as a bit of a transition because I'd like to just say a few words about this remarkable meeting, which I just came back from, or in January, at the end of January, where we had, at His Holiness's request, pulled together about 20 scientists and scholars of, from the humanities and the like, but mostly scientists, to talk about three areas that he felt over these 25 years had been the most important areas for engagement from his standpoint, namely the standpoint of Buddhist philosophy. And those were quantum mechanics and a bit of relativity, neuroscience, and the study of consciousness, all using these Western methods. And then finally, the application of contemplative practice in daily life, you could say in health areas, wellness, education, and the like. So what we were asked to do was to introduce, to help introduce for the first time in 600 years a change in the curriculum. This is one of those funny things, you know. The curriculum was set down a long time ago by like Tsong Kappa or some great scholar, you know, like Aristotle, you know. And uh, he writes it down. And when I asked Jimpa, Tujin Jimpa, this wonderful scholar and translator of His Holiness, you know, Jimpa, when was the last time that this kind of curriculum change took place? And he paused for a moment and I could see him going back through the annals of monastic education, and he said, 600 years ago. I thought, well, this is kind of an auspicious, this is an important moment then. This is very important. So in that very important moment, you have to imagine that a room with, which is about three times or four times the size of this room, jammed with senior monks. So these are the abbots of all 21 monastic universities. They are sitting behind His Holiness, and in front are all the teachers at those universities. And then down the hill, with a fiber optic line on big screens, were all being projected to several thousand monks in the adjacent hall. And so, for example, here's Tanya Singer, who runs an, a Monks Planck Institute in Leipzig on social neuroscience. Uh, Christoph Koch from Caltech, and now from the Paul Allen Brain uh, Science Research Institute, out now in Seattle. He's the chief scientist there and probably the world's foremost uh, student and scholar on, on uh, researcher on consciousness, uh, working with the Dalai Lama. So over the course, again, of six days, each day given to a particular theme with this remarkable group of Western scholars and also always paired up with Asian 
uh, Buddhist contemplative scholars that are speaking to exactly the same issues that are being raised. Here are a few, we couldn't fit them all in the picture, here are a few of the other monks who were down the, down the street uh, in the uh, large teaching hall of one of the monastic universities that were there. And in the evenings, we set up a Science for Monks uh, kind of hands-on exploratorium style exhibit. This was uh, put, to, put together by one of the people from the exploratorium who had been working for some years with the monks in preparation for this moment. So here's uh, you know, the string uh, telephone system that you had as a child. So here are a bunch of them with a central speaker and a lot of distributed listeners. So the picture is one of, you could say, a kind of development and growth that works not only to the benefit of us by the deepening in our understandings of the mind at the hands of, a, of an entirely different cultural perspective and a whole different methodology, a methodology which looks not primarily at the biology of consciousness, but at the phenomenology of consciousness. What is it actually like to look inside yourself and to do that with extreme precision associated with the highly disciplined monastic training, meditative training that such experts like Matthew Ricard have. Bringing these two worlds together has been an extraordinary joy. But now we really confront this, this dilemma, you could say. So I'm coming back now from this extraordinary event in South India. I mean, just to get into that particular province, it's a protected area. So you go into this area where the, where the monks are, these, all these tens of thousands of monks in the Tibetan mon monastics uh, are, it's a protected area, it takes six months to get a permit. And it requires a visa, which only lasts for six months, so get that. You know, you basically get there the last week of your visa, that, that the visa's valid. So getting 20 people there was hell, frankly. Um, but we managed to get it. And we come back, and we come back uh, to the problems of our community, right, to our society. Uh, when I was coming here on the train, I was reading a uh, description of the hundred great scientific discoveries of the last decade or something like that. And uh, so here's curiosity on Mars. I mean, this is pretty amazing, right? You send something up the size of an SUV and you land it on Mars and then you drive it around and pick up rocks and do chemistry and geology and what have you. It's, it's just absolutely fantastic. But the author, a guy by the name of Kluger, says, if we can do this exceedingly hard thing so well, why do we make such a hash of the challenges at home? The inventing and investing that 21st century progress demands. Why do we do that so poorly? So what's the piece that's missing? I don't think it's the technical piece. We actually have the technology and the, the know-how, if you will, to pretty much do anything we set our minds to. But there's another piece to the schooling, this comes going to come back to that secular ethics, which is how is it we cultivate not only the understanding that gets us to the moon, but gets us in some ways to address the deep problems of poverty, suffering, and so forth that are very much closer at hand. <clears throat> you know, I was at a uh, meeting called Wisdom 2.0, again, about 1,500 people. All the tech gurus are there, right? So you've got you know, the head of LinkedIn, you've got the head of Facebook, you've got the head of Google, you've got the head of this. And, and they're all up there on stage with Tunchen Jinpa and Roshi Joan Halifax and John Kabat-Zinn and you know, your standard lineup of Western contemplatives and a few Asian contemplatives. And they're talking together. You know, the high-tech Silicon Valley tycoons and then the contemplatives. And at the very last speech, Marianne Williamson said, on this stage, we have enough resources to solve the problem of world poverty and hunger. Right here. Enough assets, basically, that we could do this. And she was kind of ticked off. So we were having these nice conversations. But are you going to get to work? Or are we only going to talk shop and philosophy? And in some way, Mind and life is in a similar kind of position, I think. Are we going to only grow the academic community's interest and understanding and so forth as important and valid as that is? 
or are we doing this really for a larger purpose? And so we have this, really this kind of educational initiative that we're on the verge of. We've just begun to investigate and begun to map out, uh, tentatively being called either ethics and ethos or compassion initiative. You can give me your favorite suggestion. But it really has three sides to it. One is the science, the mapping of the mind that we're, we've been doing, the literature that we've been developing and understanding, the papers that are being written, research that's being done, and so forth. There's a whole science that's being developed over the last 25 years of work. But we really need to begin uh, the, the, the act of applying that, probably as an education. An education which is, as I say at the bottom here, a science-based secular ethics that's rooted in an understanding of interdependence, namely that we all are connected one to the other, and the practice, and I really mean the contemplative practice, the exercise of compassion. His Holiness put it this way, and this is Socrates on the other side, right? He's been given hemlock for you know, getting people to think for themselves, corrupting the youth of Athens, it was called in those days. What we need today is an approach to ethics which makes no recourse to religion and can be equally acceptable to those with faith and those without. What we need is a secular ethics. So Mind and Life's Compassion or Education Initiative is really intended to try to work with the existing players, of which there are quite a few, who are just starting to emerge and getting interested in this area, to bring the good science that is also being developed and emerging uh, in greater and greater amounts to this area so that we can create a foundation and practice field, a curriculum and a pedagogy that will work from early childhood all the, way th all the way through adult life. It will work in ways which really are able to be adapted around the world so it's not culture specific or particular religion specific and that it will enhance and give grounding to, through compassion exercises, a new kind of ethics based really in our humanity. Simply that. To be truly human means to not only put a lander on Mars, as fabulous as that is, but also to truly care for all of those who are near at hand by cultivating compassion and altruism, by becoming the change you want to see in the world through a formation of the human being themselves by this curriculum and pedagogy of compassion as a secular ethic. And just to give a little bit of a sense of how this might look, here's an article uh, that I recommend, a summary in the Smithsonian Magazine from January, this past January, where they actually look at infant proclivities. You know, do infants have innate social capacities and can they tell the, can, can they tell when people are doing nasty things to one another? Uh, and what you find is that even in very early childhood, and this is even younger than a year, one year old, uh, children will preferentially orient towards those pairs, couples, which are treating each other with dignity, respect, affection, and so forth, over those that are nasty to one another. They, in other words, they see the social relationship. That's part of the hardware that basically comes in with life. There is also an innate generosity They'd rather give than receive. There are a number of experiments that have been done where children, little tiny children, take greater pleasure in giving you something than in getting something. They also show uh, exercises of compassion and altruism. They will make their way through obstacles, courses, and so forth to help you pick up an object that you've dropped and can't quite reach. They'll toddle over through the obstacle course and give you your pen back or whatever and then make their way back to their playthings, which is the definition of altruism. You do something that has a cost to yourself. So in other words, there, there's something to work with, a lot like language acquisition. Within a community that supports the cultivation of language, we have language. We have capacities, likewise, for altruism, generosity, kindness, compassion. And the question is, how does one really develop in a systematic way, again, based on good science, you know, and what it is we're increasingly understanding, uh, a curriculum and pedagogy that appropriately cultivates these at every stage of human life. It'll be different for the little tiny tyke versus the 16-year-old versus the graduate student or such like.
You know, we're already developing, there are, I think, 56 different programs. According to the latest count, there's a database of these just been developed by the Garrison Institute. There are 56 uh, mindful education initiatives going on in North America. There's a similar survey that's about to be undertaken in Europe that we're commissioned to, 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 to do. And uh, how is it we not only develop mindfulness, for example, here's a, a group of small tykes that are doing a listening exercise. How quiet can you be and how much can you hear? It doesn't mean that you have to sit cross-legged with your chanting om or something. You know, just simply getting quiet and attending teaches the child how to be quiet and how to concentrate. With regards to uh, the cultivation of compassion, the cultivation of compassion even in children, there's a recent uh, experiment that was done, a study that was done by scholars at Emory University, uh, where they taught what they call CBCT, cognitively based compassion training, not only to adults, which they'd done for some period of time, but then switched over to working with two different populations, one a private school, a Padilla school, and another foster care children, basically the age range of six to eight years old. And you'd be surprised how amazingly uh, competent these little, these little guys are. They use what's called an analytic meditation, which is something the Dalai Lama has recommended for many years, where you, you develop an idea first, for example, the idea of interdependence, that we really are all connected to one another. And then you begin, through that sense of interconnectedness, to begin to to wish well and to, to, to practice compassion towards those that are in your first closest circle and then gradually out further and further into more active compassion for others. So this is, these are the eight steps and lessons that they give, for example, to children. Attention and stability of mind, insight into the nature of mental experience, self-compassion. And uh, Brooke, who is one of the researchers, Brooke Dodson Lavelle, has a wonderful paper where she starts out with a story, a set of a pair of stories, where, she, where some of these, which seem to be very subtle ideas or complicated ideas for these little children, they're able to grasp them and then give back answers and say the most extraordinary and profound things, indicating a depth of understanding that's, that's surprising already at that young age, I must say. So what you have here really as the next phase for mind and life seems to me to be a turning of this wonderful resource, this academic community. You know, those 150 grants that have been given by NIH, the, the 100 Varela Fellows that are now in their careers developing these sorts of research tools and capacities and understandings to take all of that emerging area, keep it going, keep pumping, keep recruiting, but now begin to turn this towards this very, in some sense, human task, this human task of caring not only about the technical achievements, but also about the soft achievements, you know, the achievements that are directed more towards the heart uh, than towards the surface of Mars, more towards making this planet a safe place for children, a place of caring and concern. And I think uh, it will require that these two great traditions, as I spoke about at the beginning, and we were speaking about the MIT meeting, that these great traditions of science and contemplative practice and, and religion, if need be, if you will, uh, come together. I like this quote from Whitehead in 1925 in the Atlantic ma magazine, where he says, when we consider what religion is for mankind and what science is, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relations between them. And I felt that somehow those relationships, which had been stressed ever since Galileo, those relationships took a real turn in 2003 at the MIT meeting. You know, there they both were, all those fancy academics up on one side, all those rogue monks on the other side, they represented those two great traditions. And they are both really extraordinary, extraordinary traditions of a complete dedication. Dedication as scientists and scholars, dedication as contemplatives with the same ardor, decades of work, and yet misunderstanding one another, missing the opportunity to come together and to talk 
openly about their common concerns, namely the well-being of the planet, ecologically, and the well-being of humanity. I like this one also from His Holiness. Not so long ago, many people viewed science's objective knowledge and the subject of understanding of Buddhism, inner science, the Buddhist inner science, as mutually exclusive. But a combination of these two can, can, can provide the complete conditions for attaining real human happiness. There's nothing really keeping us from talking to one another. And there's also nothing to keep us, I think, from having this dialogue inside ourselves. You know, because these are just two sides of our own nature. Some people seem you know, more to be on one side, the science side, and another maybe more on the contemplative, but why divide yourself? You know, why not integrate each individual as well as across the fields and disciplines? And in case you're wondering what uh, the joy of this whole thing looks like, you know, this, <laughs> this was a great moment uh, associated with a meeting we had with him in October in New York City. Uh, and he has this great habit of grabbing your hand and holding it like for a half an hour at a time. <laughs> so I happen to be the recipient of that pleasure, but he was having a great time talking about his passion of secular ethics. I had a, a lovely opportunity to talk with uh, some friends here earlier in the day, and uh, they asked me to, to announce the following, that if you're interested in beginning a local dialogue on these ideas, I won't be part of them, I'm afraid, but in working together to build a scientific understanding of the mind in order to reduce suffering and promote well-being, contact Robert Enslin. Is Robert Enslin here? He's not here, okay, at that address, all right? So that's an opportunity in case you want to connect with other people on campus about these sorts of things please contact Robert. Thank you very much. We'd be pleased to have some questions from the audience. If there are any? Well, um, oh, okay, there's my neighbor and friend. Because I am so old and um, so mindful of what has gone on, I keep thinking that we reinvent the wheel. There have been, at least in my lifetime, and I'm very old now, people who have introduced this concept uh, into the field of medicine, into all areas, social work, everything, anthropology, has there been any attempt, for example, to bring together all of the former research of people uh, who have done work at Deaconess Hospital? I'm thinking specifically of a physician at Deaconess Hospital who has helped people lower their blood pressure, uh, retain their health by doing the kind of mindful concentration. Yeah. About, I don't know anything beyond about 25 or 30 years ago. I mean, John Kabat-Zinn is usually credited with being the first person to really bring mindfulness-based stress reduction, as he calls it, into the, uh, the hospital systems and clinical systems around healthcare. Starting in Worcester, Massachusetts 30 years ago, uh, he was a graduate of MIT, again a molecular biologist, but had been practicing yoga and meditation himself for some years. Uh, and so, in a very small way to begin with, but then increasingly larger and larger numbers of folks have benefited by MBSR, as it's called. He's on our board of directors, right, and a very close friend, and uh, very active in mind and life in many of our functions. Um, I'd say the very first, you know, large-scale meeting where all of the different players came together was the last, uh, last year in Denver. We had about 700 people came together with about two or three hundred others we had to turn away, where researchers across all those different disciplines were, were, came together. Um, 
there'll be, a, as I said, another meeting in October 2014 where we have, uh, we can take up to 2,400 people and I expect we'll probably be full. And those will be from all around the world. John's work now is being done in about 300 different hospitals and medical centers uh, by people who've trained through his MBSR training, for example, if that's the kind of thing you're thinking of. So that is definitely part of uh, Mind and Life's friendship circle, if you will. And as I mentioned, there are 56 that we know of mindfulness interventions in schools. These are programs that can be very small to those which are several thousand students being affected. Just to give you one example, Kimberly Reichel, uh, Schoenert Reichel in University of British Columbia was doing, doing a study in Vancouver. Last I heard, I think she had 500 teachers that had been trained in uh, a combination of mindfulness methods, positive psychology, and uh, cognitive uh, approach. And they bring that into the school systems throughout Vancouver, doing uh, research on ways in which that can benefit school children. And I'd say these are the two main areas, health and education. Uh, but what you find is, although there have been many, many interventions, many attempts, the amount of research that documents the benefits of these and the quality of that research is still in an early phase. It was recently, not recently, maybe six years ago, a meta-analysis of all of the hundreds or some, some hundreds of papers that were written on these mindfulness interventions in health. <clears throat> and the consequence of that was that it was, at this point, too early to, to give a verdict, even though tens of thousands of people would say it's really helped. <clears throat> From a research standpoint, it's still early days. So we need to also differentiate. Usually, mindfulness is just given as a kind of universal treatment. <clears throat> so we need to know that there are you know, 40 canonical subjects of meditation in the Theravada tradition, and hundreds of different kinds of practices. So it's like which medicine for which illness? You know, if you've got, if you're depressive, what do you what do you do? If you're if you're uh, manic, what do you do? It's, so it's more not, not so much a question of leaving that behind. That's all being, being brought along. And now some of the uh, biological dimensions, the neuroscience of that, is being understood, and there's a refinement that's taking place. Plus, I'd say the compassion exercises have been very underrepresented, but mostly mindfulness, which is around waking to the present moment. But the generation of compassion in the educational settings, for example, there's only two that I know of, one at Stanford and one at Emory. Uh, a couple of questions back here. Sandy, you have one? <coughs> You referred to the meeting at Kresge Auditorium in 2003 as a major turning point uh, because it began a dialogue between scientific inquiry and contemplative inquiry focused on secular ethics. And on a parallel track, there's the Templeton Foundation and its activities which catalyze dialogue between the sciences and religion, but with a specifically theistic slant. Um, I'm quite sympathetic to the Kresge Initiative. That's one of my favorite hangouts, Kresge Auditorium. But I'm wondering how you see what the Templeton Foundation is doing in relation to what you're doing. Do you see that as uh, competitive, as irrelevant, as potentially reinforcing? Uh, it does seem to be contesting for some of the same attention. Yeah, I, I don't see them as necessarily antithetical or in competition. Um, and you know, the. Uh, the Templeton Foundation work has really, their funding patterns have changed significantly over the time since their, since their onset. I met Sir John Templeton many years ago, and, uh, and now, and there was very little interest in Buddhist philosophy in that early days. It was very Christian-oriented, 
uh, theistically oriented, as you say, and Buddhism is a non-theistic religion. So there was no interest, really, on the part of Templeton in the kind of things that Mind of Life was doing. That has changed. They now have become a significant donor into uh, Mind of Life's work. Um, they, for example, give part of the money for the Varela Awards. About half of the money comes from them for these Varela Awards. Some of the money for the Summer Research Institute, which never breaks anywhere near even, uh, comes from them. Uh, we have a Senior Scholars Fellowship Program, which is uh, maybe $350,000, $400,000 that we've gotten from them for that program. So the, the tides have shifted. Uh, the science has become so compelling in some ways kinds of thing that Richie's doing and that's going on at Stanford and Emory by really top 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 notch scientists uh, is a compelling piece. And Sir John, the original who's now deceased, Sir John was very keen on science playing a significant role in this dialogue between religion and science. And, and really I think now we're at that place where they recognize the value of what it is that's happening. You know, his holiness got um, the Templeton Award this past year, uh, last uh, 2012, he was the Templeton Award winner for science and religion, bringing these two together, together. And Mind of Life was not only mentioned in the award, but it's a $1.5 million award. It's the largest award given to a single individual uh, in excess of the Nobel by quite a bit. And the first thing he did was to give Mind of Life, and I was at that ceremony in England, uh, to give Mind of Life $200,000. He followed that up just a few weeks ago with a million dollar gift to Mind and Life, the Dalai Lama, from his book royalties. So they pile up, he doesn't know what to do with them. <laughs> and he thought of us. So, I mean, but that's also a statement of, you know, uh, on the on behalf of the Templeton folks, that they have now recognized that these non-theistic traditions also have a great deal to offer. There's a, there's a, this is something the Dalai Lama always emphasizes when we start one of the dialogues with him. You know, people in the sciences are worried. They're saying, listen, if, if, we dis if we discover something that goes against, say, Buddhist dogma, you know, Buddhist tradition, will you change? And for His Holiness, it's always absolutely. I mean, the Abhidharma gives distances to the moon that are ridiculous. They're way too short. You know, and all kind of, it's still a flat earth kind of cosmology. So it's, it's a medieval picture, you could say, that continues to this day. So he's all for rewriting those parts of the tradition. Uh, by the same token, you know, there are going to be substantial changes, like in the question of causality. Is it really true that there are events without a cause? You know, causeless events? He's not going to go slow on that one, even though quantum mechanics says we haven't seen evidence of any cause. But is it out of the quantum vacuum that there are, in fact, perturbations leading to this particular atoms decaying or not? No. So I would say that this area uh, over which there was some contention is now one where there's collaboration. And I'm hoping for much more significant collaboration in the future. Other question? A uh, very simple question. Are any of the symposia, specifically the one in Boston, open to the public? Yes, the Boston people? one is, is totally public. And uh, also these symposia, the, the summer school, the Mind and Life Summer Research Institute, is you have to one applies. We always get about two or three times the number of young people. And there's also a small number of slots for senior scholars to apply. And, this, and the uh, Visiting Scholars Program, which I have some brochures on, anybody wants to see them, I can give them to you, is also open for application. And as long as there's an alignment between the scholarship and research that's being done and what it is we're up to, and there's space, then people are welcome to come. And for young people, we also have some support that's been offered by a donor to make uh, travel and, and uh, room, room and board uh, affordable for young scholars. Okay, let's just take one or two more questions. Um, let's see, I'm the one who sent you the information on Robert Enslin 
and I knew he couldn't be here, but he volunteered to take names of people who are interested in continuing some sort of local dialogue on some of these ideas. So uh, our first step might be to get the you know, emails from anyone who wishes to um, continue to talk, and then he would set up a listserv. I didn't volunteer my own because I'm going to be out of town for a while, so um, yeah. I just wanted to give that yeah. background. Yes. Great. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, let's take, this is the last question. Uh, um, I have a question about uh, the new the European phenomenology. Yes. And my understanding is that um, neurophenomenology is using the, the discipline, the human mind, as a tool for investigation. And uh, in order the investigation is possible, the people's mind is disciplined. And my sense is that uh, the participants of of the neurophenomenological research should be the someone who have intensive meditation practice or contemplative practice. And how, I wonder how okay. much the methodology for the <laughs> neurophenomenology is yeah. developed, developed for now. Yeah, this yeah. is a very good question then. So neurophenomenology has, you might say, three, three legs to the stool. First one, it's easy is, it's not so easy, it's expensive, but it's the uh, standard neuroscience. So the neuroscience, let's say, of attention or a particular task that's being given. Second is a phenomenology of consciousness that is explored, but it only can be really truly explored by the individual if that uh, mind is attentive and restful and you know, focused in a way which is very uncommon. So, you know, both people on the planet who have that capacity, you know, should be the subjects of the study. Uh, you know, there, are, there aren't so many. Uh, so that's one of the problems with the, you might say, pure form of neurophenomenology. Uh, but there's a new uh, set of practices which have been developed by Michelle Bitbull, who you saw from one of the images, and a, the last student of Francisco Roa by the name of Claire petit Monjean. Uh, who was a scientist who became then a, uh, you could say, a philosopher of mind. So they use a second person dialogical method. In other words, something like the following. If you ask a person to do something, I don't know, to do, say, concentrate on a particular, like visual illusion, one that some of the times that some of, some of the tasks are look at an illusion and then watch it come into view. You know, maybe there's an ambiguous figure or some, some figure like a random dot stereogram and you don't see it, you don't see it, you don't see it and then gradually this thing starts to pop out and you, you see it. And you can do the neuroscience of that. Look which, light, which areas of the brain light up and try to understand it. But you can also do the phenomenology of that. What was that experience like? What, were the, what was the temporal sequence? You know, how long did it take to stabilize? Did it slip away for a while? Okay, now, um, if you ask most people what was that like, they'll give you a very curt answer. I didn't see anything for a long time and then I saw something, you know, it was really interesting. Not much information. But if you engage them in skillful dialogue, and then you begin to ask them not leading questions, but just open questions, then they begin to go back and they recall the details with much greater precision than you might have ever expected, even a relatively naive observer. They'll nuance their reflections. It's something like a good psychotherapist will do this, you know, that event in childhood, where you have a very cursory memory of it, but if you explore it, it actually can go quite deep. And so this has now been done with, uh, I think, 60 or 70 different individuals in a controlled format, looking at all the different factors that come in and confound any such dialogue. And so Claire's developed a, a uh, methodology for a general audience. So you now do a facilitated neurophenomenology. It's not, doesn't require that you be a Machu Ricard with 30,000 hours of practice or something like that, right? It's just a handful of people like that. So expert meditators is one whole class of experiments, but most of us 
even if we're meditating, it, it turns out you know, not for much, not for so long. The other thing is important to, to, to go say is that Amishi Jab down in Florida uh, has done a number of studies where she shows that even relatively short practice sessions can make measurable differences. Uh, this is even now been evidently demonstrated from to Ritchie that the, that the genomics of practice, if you, if you practice, there are certain genes that are switched on and off and that that will actually lead to structural changes in the growth and, and patterns of dendritic growth that even a single day of eight hour practice can begin to rise to the surface of detectability. That's what I'm told. I mean, part of this is because the techniques have become so amazing you know, in the neurosciences and the, and the genomics of this. But um, there's, there's really clear evidence that is showing structural changes even with relatively brief intensive practice. So it's not like we all have to go into a cave somewhere for 20 years. You know, short practices are repeated over many, many uh, days or years, let's say, can make a great difference. So thank you very much, Eric. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I, uh, I'll put out the material uh, in the front if you want to come by and take a look at anything about mind and life. Welcome to take a brochure or something.